All right, let's take a look at the last category of ways in which insects can protect themselves once these uh, plant secondary compounds uh, have actually uh, reached uh, their, their bodies. Once the tissue is consumed, there's really two different options of dealing with it. One is to get rid of that compound as quickly as possible. And this happens through a process of detoxification, making them less uh, toxic, and excretion, making them water soluble so that they can go out with the, uh, with the waste fluids. And the other is it comes in and you package it up and put it into tissues that actually are not sensitive to damage. You sequester them. You put them, you put them aside without getting them uh, out of your body. So let's take a look at these uh, in turn. This actually is a really nice schematic that kind of uh, outlines uh, the various ways in which you could think about the, um, the ways in which allelochemicals or these plant secondary uh, metabolites uh, can come in. Uh, they uh, first have to uh, come into contact with uh, insect tissue. This might be in the midgut. Sometimes it's actually on the surface uh, of the cuticle as, uh, itself. They have to actually enter the uh, the body, the internal part of the of the insect, and that that basically means going in through the gut and poking in. Uh, it basically means going into the gut and then penetrating from the gut into the body cavity, uh, into the hemocoel. Uh, once they've uh, reached this point, a couple of different things can happen, as I've mentioned. One is that the, um, uh, the metabolism of the insect can actually break down and excrete these, um, these compounds. The other one is that they're packaged away into tissues that don't matter. And the other one is uh, that the reason why these, uh, these plant secondary compounds are toxic in the first place is that they interfere with some key physiological process that the insect is trying to do. Whether it's neural signaling, or whether it's a key digestive uh, function, or whether it's uh, replication of the cell, or, or something like that. And the reason why these compounds uh, work is because they are a chemical structure that will bind usually to a protein of some kind. And that protein, once it's bound up, has these downstream uh, consequences. It either stops working because it's locked in like that, or it causes it to malfunction and, uh, and create those, uh, those problems for the insect. Well, if that protein is just in the, in the slightly different shape so that that plant secondary compound can't fit anymore, then you are uh, relatively uh, immune to the effect of that compound. It's, it's inert as far as the insect is concerned, as long as that target is no longer sensitive. So this is sometimes referred to as target site insensitivity. So where the target of that molecule that the plant uh, uh, has created uh, through mutation um, is, is of a different shape so that it's no longer, uh, no longer really a, a problem. So this is a third uh, way in which, uh, in which insects can become uh, resistant to, um, to these uh, sec secondary compounds. You can't really read this very well, but maybe if you zoom in, uh, the short of it is that uh, what this table is trying to show you is that there's all, every single one of those um, uh, mechanisms exists in insects. Uh, all of them have been documented. They've been doc documented uh, for different, um, they've been documented uh, to work uh, for different uh, plant secondary compounds uh, by uh, different insects uh, and, and, and so on. So yes, there's a lot of different ways in which uh, insects can do this. Let's take uh, one of these uh, as, a, as a, an example because it is a very well studied one. Uh, and one is the detoxification and, there, and then excretion of these, uh, of these molecules. One of the reasons why uh, these um, plant secondary metabolites can often be so problematic is that they, tend, they can be um, fat soluble. And a lot of the membranes of insect cells and of the neurons in particular are, are basically lipids. They're the classic phospholipid bilayer of, um, of, that make the structure of cells. So because these compounds are lipophilic, they can, ins they can enter cells uh, through these, uh, per through these uh, fatty membranes. Uh, if you can make these compounds less lipophilic by making them water soluble, then they can't enter as easily and they can be excreted. One of the molecules uh, that does this within the body of insects is a group of enzymes called mixed function oxidases, MFOs. And one group of mixed, func mixed function oxidases is the cytochrome P450s. 
And all you need to know about these is that they are a group of membrane-bound proteins, uh, often in the midgut. And what they do, uh, because they're uh, oxygenases, they will take uh, uh, oxygen uh, from the environment that the, that the hemocele uh, is in. They will take the substrate, which is uh, lipophilic here, and they will basically uh, combine and uh, put a hydroxyl group. And OH groups tend to make these molecules more water soluble. And in doing so, they uh, have the capacity not to enter cells and to be excreted. And so this is a, a classic way in which many insects uh, have developed ways of taking these lipid soluble substances and making them less uh, toxic is through these mixed function uh, oxidases. Mixed function oxidases, cytochrome P450s, are often inducible. That is, when these compounds start to come into the body of an insect, there is a cascade of, uh, of signaling that basically uh, alerts the, uh, the physiology of the insect that, uh-oh, we're in trouble. There's these compounds here, and when these compounds are present, it's time to start upregulating the uh, concentration of these, uh, of these molecules that will put these hydroxyl groups on the end of these, uh, of these toxins. Uh, and here's an example of uh, what happens uh, with this, uh, this cytochrome P450 activity that is sensitive to nicotine for tobacco hornworm. Tobacco hornworm is, uh, as the name implies, is actually can feed on tobacco, but it does so by upregulating these cytochrome P450s to then get rid of the, um, uh, of the nicotine. And here you can see kind of the upregulation, uh, which is dose uh, dependent here. The more nicotine you put in them, the more of these enzymes are, are produced, and therefore, the more they're able to, uh, to excrete them. And the caterpillars that are reared on nicotine in the first place are less sensitive when they re-encounter uh, nicotine uh, subsequently. So here's an example um, uh, you know, of a, a caterpillar that's never been fed on, uh, uh, that's been fed on a diet that doesn't have this and uh, one that uh, has been fed on nicotine. And uh, the ones that have been fed on nicotine and then are injected with nicotine uh, subsequently are able to kind of come back to their senses more rapidly uh, and uh, don't uh, experience these uh, classic kind of physiological twitching that is characteristic of kind of an impact on the neural uh, system compared to the ones that had not been previously exposed to the nicotine and have not had the chance to up upregulate those cytochrome P450s. Those take a much longer time to actually get back to normal, almost twice as long, and show evidence of that uh, physiological response, uh, neuro um, uh, physiological response uh, to them. Another way in which insects uh, deal with these toxic compounds is to package them up and put them into tissues that are less metabolically active. A uh, classic case uh, for this is in butterflies that feed on toxic plants. Some of these uh, um, toxic uh, secondary plant compounds are put into the wing tissues. These are generally metabolically inert uh, tissues that are not uh, sensitive, that, that is not where the important um, physiology is happening, digestion, growth, reproduction, uh, etc. They're basically a storage uh, area. Now the advantage of doing this is that uh, if uh, there's anything that tries to feed on the, uh, on the butterflies, they will encounter these secondary compounds just like the caterpillars did when they were feeding on the plants uh, originally. And you've seen this picture already in Amy's uh, talk where uh, uh, vertebrate predators that are sensitive to uh, cardenolides, these are called uh, heart uh, um, poisons sometimes because of the effects that they have on, on the neural system, will um, will find them very distasteful, uh, will throw them up, and then they will actually learn to avoid them uh, in the future. And the basic uh, story here with uh, insecticide, uh, with, uh, with resistance, actually mirrors very closely uh, something that we see with, uh, with insecticide uh, resistance uh, as well. You can think of insecticides as human manufactured or sometimes plant derived uh, compounds that act on the physiology of the insect to kill them, to otherwise uh, disable them. And just like uh, insects feeding on plants, uh, pesticides or um, insecticides particularly have to be um, encountered by the insect. It, that encounter can happen through the cuticle or through the guts and then has to find its way to the target where they will have these negative effects and kill, uh, and kill insects. 
Well, the um, uh, insects uh, under very high selective pressure, because if you can't deal with this, you're going to die, uh, um, are under very uh, strong pressure, selective pressure, to actually um, select for um, traits that allow them to um, be able to, to deal with this. Those insects that have those are going to become more common in the population compared to the ones that don't. And these include, uh, um, these include uh, things like um, reducing the likelihood that these chemicals actually enter the body uh, in the first place. Uh, so allele chemical avoidance uh, mechanisms such as behavior or sequestration. Uh, this is also a way in which uh, insects dealing with uh, insecticides can, uh, can similarly uh, deal with them. Once they have actually entered the, uh, the body, you can have uh, um, detoxification enzymes that are selected for to become more efficient at uh, breaking down or excreting uh, those. Uh, and you can also have kind of target site insensitivity uh, at the end here. So. Everything uh, from uh, uh, detoxification, avoidance, and um, insensitivity uh, that is pr present in, um, in the way in which insects deal with plants also come to bear when insects are dealing with, uh, with insecticides. And the more uh, infrequent the exposure is to either plant chemicals or to, um, or to insecticides, the more likely you are going to be using these sorts of mechanisms. Whereas if the likelihood of encounter of these chemicals is very high, then you probably will have a series of uh, traits that allow you to do this, including um, uh, these target uh, site and sensitivity. But this has to be under very high selective pressure. Here's an example uh, from uh, one of our own, Michael Crossley, a uh, former student here in our department, that actually looked at the number of genes that were uh, responsible for detoxification of one insecticide here, imidacloprid. This is a neonicotinoid, as you can guess from the name. It has similar uh, attributes as nicotine uh, has on the, the nervous system. Uh, the Colorado potato beetle, Leptinotarsa disimlineata, is one of the most damaging uh, pests of uh, potatoes and of other solanaceous uh, crops. And through its evolutionary history with uh, the solanaceae, it's been dealing with all kinds of these nasty uh, uh, nitrogen-containing um, uh, toxins throughout its uh, millennia of, of interactions. And therefore, it's uh, evolved a series of, uh, of traits uh, encoded by these genes um, that allow them to, uh, to deal with um, not only nicotine, but also with, uh, with, with the neonicotinoids, such as uh, imidacloprid. And one of them actually has to do with, in, uh, uh, some of these are expressed actually in the cuticle. Uh, others are in, the, um, uh, are in the cells themselves. Here's the cytochrome P450s, CYP, uh, beans, uh, CYP genes here. There's another class that I didn't even talk about, which are glutathione S-transferase uh, genes, which get rid of sulfur-containing uh, molecules. And here's uh, traits for uh, target site insensitivity. So this is all to say that insects are not just uh, passive partners in this relationship with, with plants, but they have the capacity to actually uh, respond to and evolve uh, resistance and traits that allow them to deal with these plant secondary uh, compounds. And this really sets the stage for these reciprocal interactions between plants and herbivores.